Hello. Today is the uh, 28th of January 2024. I'm going to talk about the difference between propaganda and um, persuasion. If I want to want to bring you to my point of view, how do I do that? Well, I could uh, hit you over the head with something until you say, yes, yes, I agree with you, every word you say. Well, that, that is not going to be a very effective way and it will not last long. So I'm going to have to use persuasion to convince you, to, for you to come around to my own point of view. And that is done in very many different ways. How does government do it? Well, in order for, for, for you to, to believe what they say or to make you think that, uh, first of all, they are telling you the truth and secondly, that um, it is the best way to do things, that the best way um, to convince you that they're doing the right thing. Okay, when this is called, uh, you know, um, manufacturing consent, creating consent, it's also called social engineering. It is the, if you want, the manipulation of public opinion too. How do they do this? Well, first of all, they cannot do it openly, that you notice. This is not sort of uh, the, uh, the Politburo um, of the Soviet Union with their five-year economic plan, you know. So that is obviously the way of totalitarian and authoritarian societies. But uh, do this or else, yeah. But in Western societies too, in our liberal democratic societies, uh, social engineering does also take place, albeit in a different way. It doesn't differently. As we are experiencing now in Western countries at the moment, this is not new, but we hadn't noticed it so much, not in such stark ways as we are seeing it right now, especially since 2014, certainly since 2020, although it really started uh, as far back as the 1920s, 100 years ago. In totalitarian societies, to use the, uh, the oft-repeated uh, phrase, I think it was uh, coined by Roosevelt, to use the carrot or the stick. In totalitarian societies, to get consent or obedience, obviously we can see it is the stick that is used. But the carrot, however, is used also by um, in, in our democratic societies in the West to convince, to persuade, to cajole, increasingly to censure or to punish even. These are all conditioning methods to punish or reward. Increasingly we see the role played by psychology here, behavioral psychology more exactly. You remember the nudge method. We saw it clearly at work during the global uh, flu-like um, epidemic just three years ago. What is particularly different is that this is done, has to be done furtively, not openly. Let us say by seduction. It has been used, of course, in advertising for a long time, in marketing 
to sell you products. We realize that when we see a commercial on television that this is openly something that they are trying to sell you. Beautiful women, if they're trying to sell you a car, or beautiful beaches and sunshine, if they're trying to sell you lipstick, whatever. We do not believe the commercial, but are we influenced by it? Yes, we are. Some people more than others. This uh, seduction uh, is becoming less and less seductive at the moment and more and more authoritarian. The health crisis of three years ago taught us all a lot of things. We saw things we had never seen before, perceived before, not so clearly anyway. I don't want to make a point now of talking about the crisis of 2020, not really, that's not the purpose of this, but we all have to get used to the fact that we are all going to see that more and more when explaining societal changes, more and more we're going to have to go back to that year of 2020 as a pivotal year in politics, in our relationship to our governments, how we see our government. The world changed that year, it seems. The whole population in our countries was practically, let's say, um, confined. There are the stronger words, of course, for what happened. And this, we can say, came from not the stick, but from the carrot side of moving whole societies, although there was quite a bit of stick to. But in a way this was still a method of creating consent, manufacturing consent. This is the, the, uh, the expression used by political theories Noam Chomsky and uh, Walter, Walter Lippmann. Okay? Theorists of how public opinion can be manipulated. If you think about it, this is just a new way of renaming propaganda, but in a much more sophisticated way. It was the nudge method that was used on the population to go through its um, confinement <laughs> at home. More easily, less people thought, God, forgive, God forbid, that uh, they were being imprisoned in their own homes in some way. So a campaign, an active campaign, was launched using sometimes influencers, you know, people who the public admire for different uh, diverse reasons, actors and singers and what have you, continually, continually. I'll come to the media in a moment but continually setting in your brain that this, what the government was asking you to do, was absolutely necessary. To save lives, stay at home, to be, for this to be effective. And it usually is, but not always though. Sometimes it crashes. We must not think that behavioral psychologists are so much brighter than we are, that they are always ten steps ahead of us. But my point here is that this method is an incentive, a non-authoritarian incentive for you to do what others want you to do, this manufacturing consent is getting your approval to do things gradually. And it is 
very important for it to be done, as I said, furtively, by stealth, surreptitiously. You must not, above all, become aware that you are being led. You must, above all, believe that it is you making the decision, you voluntarily, given the evidence provided to you, you have reached that decision, and you agree with it. And it has to be done smoothly. People um, in, the, in the West, until recently at least, would not respond to being hit by a 2 by 4 But you see, too many of us are used to a certain hedonistic behavior. Me, me, me. Yeah. So this is, after all, what makes a consumer society possible, successful. But you have to use a certain amount of subterfuge for it to be successful. They have to become, as it were, flatterers, to flatter us, to puff up our egos. In other words, power. The power behind it has to be, let us say, invisible, unseen. And this is in order to get behavior modification. Flattery, fear, whatever it is used to change your behavior. If done well, it will trigger in the population what is needed for that population to go this way or that way, to love or to loathe this or that leader, to this country or that country. Especially so on the gullible. And I'm not using this word here in a negative sense necessarily. I mean those who do not question, um, do not necessarily use a critical thinking um, skills, awareness, but also, I'm not suggesting that these are the same people at all, um, by, uh, can be good, honest, decent people because they trust. And we're going to talk a lot about trust. And this trust by decent people is essential. This is the means by which they're going to be manipulated. The whole thing works because you trust. This is what is being misused or abused. The government, the media, both are part of the same, let's say, official body, in that they are or they seem, they seem to be legitimate. They have credibility with most people. So, yes, of course, I will listen to them. I will listen to the media, also a source of authority for a lot of people. Some people, older people, have not noticed that the main media has changed alliances. Their objective is not the same as it was that it is now a business, so money and profit more vital than truth. Impartiality, neutrality. But because it continues to have this authority now, like the government, they're going to get the consent, the assent from you the yes from you, the voluntarily yes, I assent, I agree with you. Think of the Oedipus complex, the mother, the father and their role. I will tell you the story of Oedipus 
the tale, the mythological tale at the end. I know that practically all of you will know it, but some of you may not, so I will, I will tell you what the story is about. But this Oedipus complex was used very much on individuals by Freud first and then just about uh, every psychologist in order to try to find out to clear certain psychological uh, difficulties on individuals. And what you have is the, in stark terms, the father, authoritative figure, patriarchal and so on, doing things one way. And the mother, all loving, all encompassing, the mother who never says no to you. How never says no to, to, to what you want or to how things ought to go. So in fact, this doting mother, this mother who never says no, it's always soliciting a yes from you. This is in fact the factory, as it were, of conformity, of conforming, conformism, perhaps. This patriarchal authority, this matriarchal speech, of course, as I said, Freud and so many others have talked about it, but it is used now, it, it has, it has uh, been transferred from the individual to society at large by behavioral psychology. Um, I would say pretty much in bed with the powerful. So that you accept that your social and political behavior is, and your opinions, is something that you yourself decided on, that you are in control. It is your decision, and this is essential for it to work. Sometimes it doesn't quite work, because in spite of everything, we all still have the instinct of self-preservation. It's still there, it still exists which might many times go against the official propaganda or the narrative, as it is called nowadays, the script. And so, fundamentally, the purpose of power, those who apply it, use it in the behavioral sciences, and they, and, and they use it to try to reverse this sense that you have of self-preservation, this self-preservation instinct, that is what they want to reverse. In other words, don't believe your lying eyes, as it were. If you do, you're not, you may not be seeing the whole picture kind of thing, trust us. And this invisible attack on your instinct for self-preservation is where psychological power is exercised in order to get what? In order to get control. We have known this for a long time. Experiments done, my goodness, you go back to the 30s, even before, in the 40s. Um, this knowledge is now being applied to society um, by behavioral psychologists. But you see how it works. I have one of the most famous cases. This is a very, very old one. Is in a lab. They got some university students just to see how people might be influenced by the fact that everybody else is going in one direction and you are afraid not to go along. 
This was the experiment. A group of university students in the know were asked, I got this already, look, if I have these three sticks here, okay, one is this length, the other is, let's say, this length, and the other is, let's say, this length. Can you see it? Okay, so this is A, the one in the middle is B, the one here is C. Obviously, C is longer than B, and B is longer than A, than, than, and B is longer than and well, C is longer than A, and A is longer than B. You see it, right? Okay, so in the experiment, the group of students, they were all told that they had to give the wrong answer. Only one of the students didn't know and he was just going to answer truthfully. So they started with student number one. Question, which is the longest stick? And student number one would say is A. And student number two would say A. And all of them, until they got to the this particular student who was not in the know, and he told the truth. He said, no, C is the longest. Okay. He was the only one who gave that answer. And so they did another one, and again it was the same thing, with different sticks and different things. So he was the only one who was given, given the, the, the right answer. But after a while, after the third or the fourth, he began to think, oh, why am I the only one? Perhaps I am the one who's wrong, since everybody else is saying that it is stick A, the longest. So, in the fourth attempt, he changed his opinion. Well, he changed his answer. And he just said what the other said. This is a very old, I mean, if you study psychology, you, you study this in, you know, your second lesson, okay? But this has become much more sophisticated. So psychologists know that eventually, at first, you may say, no, I don't think so. The way I see it is this. But eventually, if everyone else is saying or doing something completely different. Most people feel insecure enough to just, hmm, perhaps I'm wrong, perhaps my eyesight, perhaps something, perhaps I'm the one who's wrong. And they will eventually follow. Now, see the difference. From power in the Oedipus thing, the father, the, the uh, patriarchal authority, power coming from above, that's one way of convincing you. But also from below, which is Control, power or control, different ways of doing it. And the control from below, from the mother side of it. The difference is that with the former, with power, you eventually acquiesce and agree in order to in order to avoid the torture in your brain, as it were. You remember in um, 1984, in uh, uh, Orwell's uh, book, 1984, you know, they're using this 
totalitarian propaganda thing and they're asking how many fingers are here? How many fingers do I have? Well, four. No, it's five. Oh, sorry, it's four. No, you will see that, ta -da, you know, the <laughs> if you want to survive, if you want to get along with everybody, you will see that perhaps by saying that there are five fingers here, eventually he will acquiesce in order to avoid being tortured psychologically. So at the end, you're going to say, yes, fine. Why? Because, and you're going to give yourself reasons for doing that. You know, you, if, if you say five fingers, that you're not telling the truth. But you're going to give yourself reasons. Well, you know, I'll just say that it's five and then this torture will end and I know very well therefore, but I will acquiesce, I will consent, okay? So that I can get on with my life. You will give yourself reasons, you will give yourself reasons, but at the end of it, you have said there are five fingers here. Okay, so that's power, okay? But we're talking about, we're going to talk about control, which is slightly different. So with the power, you agree, you acquiesce, you give in and agree in order to, as I said, to, to stop this torture in your brain. You just want to just be done with it and go ahead with the, go on with your life. With the latter, with the control, you never have to give in, not really, because you were never aware of the hidden control with the pandemic, for example. After a while, people started questioning this and that, not at the very beginning, but, you know, after a few months, perhaps a year, people started questioning. Uh, perhaps they saw that things were getting a little bit out of hand, for example, but, 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 they still went along, nonetheless, um, with the narrative. People, good, decent people, on the whole, because they were disciplined, they were encouraged to trust. This is this trust thing is a very basic principle in social engineering. Trust. Otherwise it doesn't work. In this social engineering manipulation in social psychology, this is equivalent to you saying when you in a way acquiesce, you say to yourself, this is my own personal contribution to the well-being of society as a whole. I am doing my bit for the well-being of all. And we have now seen uh, in a large uh, number of, of, of generations of research studying human behavior, talking about this, who talk about this uh, taking control, as it were, of your consciousness. This is the thing, taking control of your consciousness taking control of what they say, relationships of trust, distrust, and indifference, and how to address each, manipulate each. This trust thing is on top of the agenda for, as I see it, many in the global 
Western oligarchy, let's call it that. At the World Economic Forum, for example, in Davos, the last one, just a few days ago it ended, I commented in another video the most important thing this year was this question of trust, how to regain people's trust. They are aware, they are losing it. And if they lose it, if they lose control, if they lose it, if they lose this trust, control is going to be much more difficult. In fact, it may not be possible. They must regain the public trust. It doesn't seem to occur to them that the reason they are losing it is because they have been making so many mistakes themselves, the oligarchs. They're so desperate that we see them now lying, we have been seeing them lying, lying openly to our face. As if they were saying sometimes, I don't care what you think, I'm so powerful, I have the power, you can't do anything about it. It is almost, almost as clear as that, you can see it. Because those uh, leaders, those politicians, uh, those influence, influencers uh, starting, started using methods of con that uh, who are now using these methods of control. I don't think they're very bright. <laughs> Not in emotional intelligence at any rate, let us say. So they have made the gravest error and that was to make their power visible. You're not supposed to do that. You lost the control of persuasion, the appeal of seduction when you say, I am here to seduce you. You lost it. And so in Davos, as I was saying, not a very bright bunch, the seal is, I suppose. Like, I said this in another video too, like Ursula van der Leyen. He, she gave a speech, and the title of the speech was Restoring Trust. That was the title. Trust, trust, trust. She kept talking about it. More important now, regaining this trust, that the, than the injection or the climate change or anything else. The most important thing nowadays, the objective for them, is to regain this trust, restoring trust. And because she is intellectually not superior, I would say, she actually offered ways of restoring this trust. And she came up with censuring those evil independent media outlets who go about injecting disinformation and misinformation on into the public discourse. And they must be closed down. There are not only her, there are many who are saying this. Close them. In other words, you will trust us. They are moving away to a sort of a more open propaganda, almost. They are worried. Because no trust, no power, no control. So this uh, more uh, motherly approach in behavioral science is disappearing fast. How to keep control? Little by little, if you lose that control, you'll have to go to that father for following on this Oedipus uh, complex thing. 
raw power, the Orwell model, which might not work in Western societies, or it might. Might have to make uh, preparations for it. There are quite a few signs that this is being done, that they are losing power. Again, in Davos, for example, in, the, in, in Davos, in, in this last uh, World Economic Forum, the intellectuals who work on the oligarchs, public, uh, who, who work for the for the oligarchs, published an article on the World uh, Health Organization website, stating clearly the fact that the general public has lost confidence in the medical profession, for example. That's it. Not that uh, that people are saying, I don't believe a word my doctors say. No, not, not that yet. But certainly the blind confidence that we used to have in our doctors seems to have gone a little. Large for a large part of the population. As I said before, not for the gullible, of course, but for a, for a lot of people. And not only uh, trust on doctors, but also in, you know, medical, in medical fields, for example, uh, corporations um, that we now know pay them well. Um, most research, medical research is paid by them. The doctors uh, were given incentives, for example, for we now know for each vaccination, small amount at first, but it got as far as 250 pounds for each one at the end. So they need they need your trust back now. They need your trust to get back into your brain. Think of computer hacking in your brain. Think of identity theft. They need to get you back to that place where if tomorrow the government says we need to do this, we need to do that, we need whatever it is, ID cards, camera surveillance uh, cameras in your own house, whatever it might be, you're going to say, yes, of course, I give my assent, I believe you because I know that this is for my own good. Cameras in my home, yes, of course, because they're good to catch criminals. Very worthy enterprise. You've been hacked. But we trust less since 2020. In 2020, we were taken by surprise. There had been other health crises, if I remember correctly, one in 2009, I think it was the swine flu, something like that. And at that time, after a little while, you thought, you might have thought, hold on, is this... Um, is this a commercial enterprise in tandem with this flu thing? But in 2020, they toughened their tone a little bit because we went as far as being confined at home. So we thought, no, this is, this is going beyond a flu. Some of us thought, thought that. This is actually going beyond a commercial operation. I thought 
this is politics. This is behavioral psychology being used. The mass psychosis thing, all that. This is social engineering. And this, in fact, is a complete restructuring of society. When your instinct for self-preservation kicks in, listen to it. Because what someone might be trying to do is to instill in you that this instinct that you have naturally for self-preservation is bad advice. Don't listen to it yourself. This is not happening everywhere, although it can happen everywhere, regardless of culture. It's, it's human psychology. But it is collapsing in Western European countries, not so much in Eastern European countries. I'll get to that, perhaps. Because since the 1960s, especially, the sexual revolutions of the 1960s and all that uh, all that uh, that revolution that looks so cool because we were defying authority and so on it looks so modern we were actually playing with things that we may not have quite understood at the time or the consequences of it we might not have understood we are just now just now beginning to see the consequences after two generations and the consequences Now that it, uh, that original sexual revolution is, has gone much further than that, it's no longer a sexual revolution, but it is how it's a, it's a movement of identity, of self-identification now, in fact. It can be a man in the morning, a woman in the evening, but <laughs> I'm exaggerating, obviously. But it is stream, but uh, my example, but it is no laughing matter. This sense that you can change your identity and then go back if you change your mind. Very fluid. But what is the goal of all this, you can ask? Why, why would they do that? Why, well, because these confrontations, these are shocks to, uh, to our psyche. These are cultural, religious, social, psychological shocks. children at school being entertained by shocks that have become sort of boomerang effects. They are like cluster bombs in the field of war. They shock you and this is going to have repercussions and consequences. Why? Because we have kicked the door open. We have practically killed religion, shattered psychological walls, crushed them. It's okay if you call them taboos, that you can call them whatever you want, but these um, moral principles and psychological walls uh, they, if you, if you break them down, 
if you remove them, these religious, moral, psychological constraints, what you may find at the other side of the fence may not necessarily be more freedom, as a matter of fact. What you may find is more cares. Hence this construction, these erections of uh, erection of walls to begin with, these traditional mores, which were in fact fortification walls, as it were, not to keep you imprisoned, although at first it might to some appear like that, but to keep you safe based on tradition, that is, what previous generations, even thousands of years before us, had learned. So, in the West, we kicked the door open. And though it looked like freedom and fresh air in the 60s and in the 70s, I was there. Two generations later, what we have is an explosion of mental pathologies we call borderline, neurosis, psychosis, an epidemic of depression, which is really being sad, and also sexual perversion. I say sexual perversion, perversion especially because all moral depravity will end up being displayed physically in the body and within the body through it will eventually get to the sexual drive. There was a book written in uh, the 1990s um, I don't remember the name of the author right now, but it was called uh, Disease, Diseases of the Soul, Confronting the Hidden Issues of the Heart. I haven't read it myself, I have heard about it a few things, but just the title to suggest that many of our psychological problems could be in fact based on lack of spiritual fulfillment or spiritual emptiness because you remember G.K. Chesterton when he said if you believe in nothing you believe anything and these pathologies do actually prevent many from will prevent many people from fitting in for finding a job or keeping a job, even to be able to look for one. The best known of this is the attention deficit disorder. It's all over the place in the West. Everyone seems to have it. Hyperactive children that cannot keep still. There is an epidemic of attention deficit disorders. In some countries, like Canada, they are immediately, the children are immediately put on drugs. These children, many of them will probably become drug addicts when, by the time they reach adolescence. Anyway. Yes, uh, there are consequences to social engineering, to manipulating public opinion. It has the function of, let's say in inverted commas, liquefying what is solid, liquefying the human species making humans more malleable. Moral principles, customs, traditions, psychological wars, traditions 
prevent that. But why? Why would you want these changes? Why would you want to make human beings more malleable? Security insecurity. These engineering scientists know that when people are safe, secure, happy in their environment, when you have a stable society, in that society people actually have the cognitive means to say no. I oppose that. No. We didn't want to do this. We, 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 we don't want you to do this, government. We want you to do that. The opposite or whatever. That is when you can say no, that is when you are safe and secure as a people, confident. But when there is chaos and fluidity and disorder, psychological disorder, internally at least, in your brain, you don't have a, you're not a, a trunk, you're a sort of a branch sort of flowing around in your mind. In other words, when you have no home, when there is no roof, no doors, no walls, no windows in your psychic, it is easier for someone to come and say follow. And you will do it to be safe. Psychologically, it is chaos and disorder within yourself in your brain that makes you insecure as a matter of fact and when you are insecure you grasp on to just about anything that you can get hold of in order to survive since we're talking about security and insecurity let me remind you of Jeremy Bentham's The Panopticon. Jeremy Bentham in the mid-1700s is a British philosopher. Actually, he, was, he, um, he wrote the constitution for, uh, for a lot of countries and, and for most of his life, actually, he was more famous in France and other countries than he was, than he was in England. But uh, after after his death, certainly his writings uh, were recognized and accepted. And every A-level student knows that Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian, you know, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, that guy. He, uh, in order to control, uh, he was writing about society, okay, how to control society. And he devised this idea of the panopticon, pan meaning all, and optical meaning optics, seeing, okay? And the idea of a prison where the inmates, their cells, the doors to their cells are open, but they do not leave. Why not? They cannot see the guard. They never know whether the guard is there or not. It's easier when you see your jailer because if he disappears and he's not there, if you have a chance, you escape. But when you don't know whether he's there or not, you constrain yourself. You don't know. So, this is how he described it. The inmate must not know, must never know, whether he is being watched at any one moment. But he must be sure that he may always be so. It was a model of how society should function. In order to have people under control, 
the populace needs to believe that any person could be surveyed at any time. In time, you see, people internalize it and police themselves. The inmates in this panopticon cannot see where, whether or not there is a person, a guard in the tower. So they don't know. They could be watched at any moment. And to conclude, since I spoke in passing about the Oedipus uh, complex, perhaps, as I said at the beginning, you would like to know what the story is about. Most of you will, <laughs> I know, will, and you'll probably be able to tell it better than, than I can. Um, so uh, I'm going to actually read it if I can find it here. Let me see. So this is the story of the tale, the mythological tale of Oedipus, taken from the Sophocles uh, play with uh, the, um, the, 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 the Sphinx riddle that uh, uh, he leads to. Okay, so King Laius of Tibis. Tebes is a city still there in Greece. Uh, it's a sort of northwestern part of Athens. King Laius of Tebes was the third in descent from Cadmus. He married a distant cousin, Jocasta. With their reign, Apollo's oracle at Delphi began to play a leading part in the family's fortunes. Apollo was the god of truth. Whatever the priestess at the Delphi said would happen infallibly came to pass. To attempt to act in such a way that the prophecy would be made void was as futile as to set oneself against the decrees of fate. Nevertheless, when the oracle warned Laius, the king, that he would die at the hands of his son, he determined that this should not be. When the child was born, he bound its feet together and had it exposed on a lonely mountain where it must soon die. He felt no more fear, therefore. He was sure that on this point he could foretell the future better than the god. He defied the god. His folly was not brought home to him, though. He, he would eventually be killed, indeed, but by his son, as a matter of fact. But he never knew that. He thought that the man who attacked him was a stranger. He never knew that in his death, he had proved Apollo's to be, the, to be true. When he died, Laius the king was away from home, and many years had passed since the baby had been left on the mountain. It was reported that a band of robbers had slain him together with his attendants, all except one who brought the news home. So only one attendant came back saying he was killed, the child was killed. The matter was not carefully investigated because Tevez was in sore straits at the time. The country, in fact, uh, ar ar around it, around the town, was beset by a frightful monster, the Sphinx, a creature shaped like a winged lion but with the breast and face of a woman. She lay in wait for the wayfarers along the roads to the city, and whomever she sees, she put a riddle to, telling him if he could answer it, she would let him go. No one could, 
and the horrible creature devoured man after man until the city was in a stage of siege. The seven great gates which were the tavern's pride remained closed and famine drew near to the citizens. So matters stood when there came into the stricken country, into the city a stranger, a man of great courage and great intelligence, whose name was Oedipus. He had left his home in Corinth, which is also still there, <laughs> southwestern, uh, southwest of Greece by the Peloponnese there. Okay, so he had left uh, Corinth, where he was held, and everyone thought, including himself, that he was the son of the king of Corinth, Polybus. And the reason for his self-exile, he left Corinth, was another Delphic oracle. Apollo had declared that he, Oedipus, was fated to kill his father. Well, he thought that his father was Polybus. So he too, like Laius, his father, his real father, thought that it would be a good idea to make it impossible for the oracle to come true. So he resolved never to see Polybus again. And he left the city. He didn't want to be tempted into killing him. And in, this, in his lonely wanderings, he came into the country around Tevis. And he heard what was happening there, which was obviously in a stage of siege. And he wanted to save it. So although he was homeless and friendless, uh, and for him life meant little, he determined to seek out the Sphinx and try to solve the riddle in order to save the city. What creature, the Sphinx asked him, goes on four feet in the morning, at two, uh, on two at noonday, on three in the evening? Man, answered Oedipus. In childhood he creeps on hands and feet, in manhood he walks erect, in old age, he helps himself with the staff. It was the right answer. The Sphinx inexplicably, but most fortunately, killed herself. The Tevans were saved. Oedipus gained all and more now than what he had left behind. The grateful citizens made him their king, and he married the dead king's wife, Jocarta. Jocasta, who was in fact his mother. For many years they lived happily. It seemed that in this case Apollo's words had been proved to be false. But when their two sons had grown to manhood, Tevis was visited by a terrible plague. A blight fell upon everything. Not only were men dying throughout the country, but the flocks and herds and the fruits of the field were blasted as well. Those who were spared death by disease faced death by famine. No one suffered more than Oedipus. He was the king. He regarded himself as the father of the whole state. The people in it were his children. The misery of each was his misery too. So he dispatched Jocasta's brother, Creon, to Delphi to implore the gods' help. Creon returned with good news. Apollo had declared that the plague would be stayed but, but upon one condition. Whoever had murdered King Laius would have to be punished. Well, Oedipus was enormously relieved. Surely the man or the man could be found even after all these years, and they would know well how to punish him. 
So he proclaimed to the people gathered to hear the message Creon had brought back. Let no one of this land give shelter to him. Bar him from your homes as one defiled, companioned by pollution. And solemnly I pray, may he who killed wear out his life in evil, being evil himself. Oedipus took the matter in hand with energy. He sent for Teresius, the old blind prophet, the most revered of Thebans. Teresius, um, the, the blind prophet, the wise man, appears in many mythological tales. Had he any means of finding out, he asked him, who the guilty were? That was Oedipus' question to Teresius. And to his amazement and indignation, the seer at first refused to answer. For the love of God, Oedipus implored him, if you have knowledge, fools, Teresius said, fools all of you, I will not answer. But when Oedipus went so far as to accuse him of keeping silence because he had himself taken part in the murder, the prophet in his turn was angered, and words he had meant never to speak fell heavily from his lips. You are yourself the murderer you seek. To Oedipus, the old man's mind was wondering. What he said was sheer madness. He ordered him out of his sight and never again to appear before him. Jocasta, too, treated the assertion with scorn. Oh, neither prophets nor oracles have any sure knowledge, she said. She told her husband how the priestess at Delphi had prophesied that Laius should die at the hand of his own son, and how he and she together had seen to it that this should not happen by having the child killed. And besides, Laius was murdered by robbers, where the three roads meet on the way to Delphi, she concluded triumphantly. Oedipus gave her a strange look. When did this happen? He asked slowly. Just before you came to Tebes, she said. How many were with him? Oedipus asked. There were five in all, Jocasta spoke quickly, all killed but one. I must see that man, he told her. Send for him. Well, I will, she said, at once. But I have a right to know what is in your mind. You shall know all that I know, he answered. I went to Delphi just before I came here to Tevis, because a man had flung it in my face that I was not the son of Polybus. So I went to ask the god. He did not answer me, but he told me horrible things, that I should kill my father and that I would marry my mother and have children that men would shudder to look upon. So I never went back to Corinth. And so on my way to Delphi, at a place where the three roads meet, I came upon a man with four attendants. He tried to force me from my path, so, and he struck me with his stick. Angered, I fell upon them and I killed them. Could it be that the leader was Laius, the one man left alive brought back a tale of robbers, Jocasta said. Laius was killed by robbers, not by his son. The poor innocent one died upon the mountain. As they talked, 
a further proof seemed given them that Apollo could speak falsely. A messenger came from Corinth to announce to Oedipus the death of Polybus. O oh, oracle of the god, Jocasta cried, where are you now? The man died, but not by his son's hand. The messenger smiled wisely. Did the fear of killing your father drive you from Corinth? He asked. Ah, King, you were in error. You never had reason to fear, for you were not the son of Polybus. He brought you up as though you were his, but he took you from my hands. Where did you get me? Oedipus asked. Who were my father and mother then? I know nothing of them, the messenger said. A wandering shepherd gave you to me, a servant of Laius. Jocasta turned white. A look of horror was on her face. Why waste the thought upon what such a fellow says, she cried. Nothing he says can matter. She spoke hurriedly, yet fiercely, fiercely. Oedipus could not understand her. My birth does not matter? He asked, for God's sake, go no further, she said. My misery is enough. She broke away and rushed into the palace. At that moment, an old man entered. He and the messenger eyed each other curiously. The very man, O king, the messenger cried. The shepherd who gave you to me. And you, Oedipus asked the other, do you know him as he knows you? The old man did not answer, but the messenger insisted, You must remember you gave me once a little child you had found, and the king here is that child. Curse you, the other muttered. Hold your tongue. What? Oedipus said angrily. You would conspire with him to hide from me what I desire to know? There are ways, be sure, to make you speak. And the old man wailed, Oh, no, do not hurt me. I did give him the child, but do not ask more, master. For the love of God, do not ask more. If I have to order you a second time to tell me where you got him. You are lost, Oedipus said. Ask your lady, the old man cried. She can tell you best. She gave him to you? asked Oedipus. Oh yes, oh yes, the other groaned. I was to kill the child. There was a prophecy. A prophecy, Oedipus repeated, that he should kill his father? Yes, the old man whispered. A cry of agony came from the king. At last he understood. All true, now shall my light be changed to darkness. I am accursed. He had murdered his father. He had married his father's wife, his own mother. There was no help for him, for her, for their children. All were accursed. Within the palace, Oedipus wily sought for his wife, but was his mother. He found her in her chamber. She was dead. When the truth broke upon her, she had killed herself. Standing beside her, he too turned his hand against himself, but not to end his life. He changed his light to darkness. He put out his eyes. The black world of blindness was a refuge. Better to be there in the dark than to see with the strange, shamed eyes the old world 
that had been so bright. It's the end of my talk today. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe if you're still with me here. Bye-bye.